So, it is a graduation Sunday. Typically, this is a very low attendance. It's pretty good for a graduation Sunday. Next couple weeks are graduation Sunday. So, I, I promised I would try to keep it short, and I am going to try. Um, I do have to warn you one more time. This is the last time I'm going to have to say this. I really think so. Ma- Megan, you don't have to leave. She told me to say that if she got up and left because of graduation. But So, uh, again... I know it's graduation Sunday, guys. I'm not going to be insulted if you have to go, okay? People always get super worried that I'm going to be insulted because they have to get up and leave early. But this last Sunday, I'm going to have to say, it's been a really bad morning for my eye. A bunch of you guys know about it. This has been one of the worst days. Um, so it, it has been bleeding this morning, if it's bleeding. Bud said real men cry. Real men cry blood, bro. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> But there is a chance it's going to happen, but this is going to be the last time because I go in and I get it fixed on Thursday. And so here's the deal. People keep asking me, so are you worried? Are you nervous? I get nervous. I get little, like, hinges of nervousness, right? But, but here's the deal. I've seen God do crazy things this week, crazy things, breakthroughs, miracle things, hopeless things where you see that God is moving. I've seen God touch hearts. I've seen God touch minds. I've seen God touch attitudes. And if he can do that, this is simple stuff to me. I mean, if God can touch a heart and a mind and an attitude and 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 do miracles there, then then I got nothing to be be worried about. But that is on Thursday, so I probably won't be here next week. Um, Lori will be will be preaching and I'll probably be laying in bed. But we'll see. Maybe I'll be here. Here's, here's the other thing. With that said, with the stuff that I've seen happen this week and testimonies we've, we've heard, uh, Bud, would you agree with me? Pray for nothing less than a real miracle. Nothing less. Pray for real miracles, man. You know, I, I, I get sick of weak prayers, man. Seriously, man. Pray for miracles. God, if you need something in your life, pray God does it in a big way. Or don't waste your time. That's right. Uh, and man, I, I don't know. I, I can't get over the praise thing from last week, man. You know, uh, last week, maybe I'll preach this message. I don't know. <laughs> last week, th- this is really cool. Last week, uh, you know, this has never happened this way before. Paul, Paul said something last week. I was, and I was in the back talking to my wife, like I shouldn't have been doing right during praise. I was, I was talking to my wife. Paul said, I don't think, I don't think God is done or something along those lines. And, and as soon as he said that, like this message dropped in my head, like the whole, th- I just, I just started walking up right when he said it, you know, and, and it's never happened quite that way before. And, and the message was, if you remember this, basically make your praise bigger than your problem. If you're going through something big, if there's something major in your life, whatever it is, if you go, it's so big, it's keeping me from praising. I said, make your praise bigger than that. And you get the choice. You get to do that. And, and what did you tell me after church, Paul? Do you remember? Okay, so we, we, the, the church sent Paul and Greg to a worship conference. And, and, and what did you tell me afterwards, Paul? Isn't that cool? I had no idea. I had no idea. I think it's, I think it's a, a big thing, and, and Paul and I have been talking because I really think that, that, that God has been speaking to me, and I think God is speaking to Paul about teaching our church to live a lifestyle of praise. When things go bad, you've got to praise more, I think. It's, it's difficult, but I think, I think this is how things get better, okay? So that's just a, that's just a little side note that I thought I, I should have said. So. Trying to keep it a little bit shorter today, no promises, but I am going to try if, I, if it's not, it's John's fault because he took, took up time, okay? So I, I read this story. Um, I read this story quite a while ago. So if I've shared it before, I'm, I'm sorry. But it's just kind of stuck with me since I, I read it. You know, we get these, uh, we get a bunch of Christian magazines here at the church. Uh, uh, they just come, and Erica puts them in my mailbox, and I usually put them in the trash can, <laughs> or, or I put them in the bathroom or whatever, you know. I don't, I don't typically read them. There's just a lot of them, right? And so one, one day, though, I, just, I was just reading this article, and, and it was about being thankful 
And, and there was this story in it that just kind of stuck with me. And it was about this guy who had gone to church one Sunday with his family. And as soon as he left church, he just started complaining about everything. He complained about the pastor's preaching. Glad you guys don't ever have to do that. He started talking smack about other people within the church. He complained about drivers on the road. He started calling them names. He complained about the waitress at the restaurant that was taking his order. And then he complained about the food when it got there. But he still, when the food came, he still took the time with his family to stop and thank God that he had a place that he could go and worship freely. He thanked God that he had a meal to eat and all that kind of stuff. And he thanked God for all the blessings that, that he had been given. And so while they were eating, their little son spoke up and asked the dad, do you think God heard you while you were praying and telling him how thankful you were? And the dad said, yeah, I, I believe that, that God hear, heard me. And so then the little boy said, well, do you think God heard you when you were complaining about everything as soon as you left church today? And the dad was kind of embarrassed, and he said, yes, I know he heard that also. And so the little boy scratched his head and said, which one do you think he believed? And I tell that sort of in a joking way, because it's written in sort of a joking way, but I know for sure it has to be a little bit convicting to other people in here and not just me. When I, when I read this story, it was, it was super convicting to me. This is a big problem that the body of Christ has struggled with for a really long time, since the beginning. It's that what we claim we are, and a lot of times what we've convinced ourselves that we are, and what we actually are, aren't the same thing. And if we're really careful, and we would really look at our lives, and we would really examine ourselves, we would probably find out, you can correct me if I'm wrong when you leave, we would probably find out that there is something sinister lurking inside of all of us still. It's something that's subtle, and sneaky, and it disguises itself as white lies. It disguises itself as like this, you know, meaningless name-calling out of anger, silly words that just didn't need to be said, little things like that, which I think are the evidence that there's still something dark inside of us that we need to work on. The big problem is that that same dark and sinister thing inside of us will try really hard to convince us that we're okay. And, and he'll even make the list for us of reasons why, why we're okay. You go to church on Sunday. Go to Bible study. You sing and you raise your hands during worship. You pray for Every single meal, you pray. When you need something, you pray. And you even tithe. You got to be good, right? And so you use this list of things or this, this, this sinister thing inside of us. We we'll use this list of things to convince us that we're good. You guys know what that's called? You might be surprised. That's called religion, man. And believe it or not, God doesn't like religion. If that's, if that's shocking to you, it's because you haven't walked with Jesus as long as some of us. God doesn't like religion. I said this on Easter. God is not about religion. God is about relationship. It's a totally different thing. And it's a game changer. When it comes to knowing Jesus. In fact, in James 1.27, this is what God says about religion. This is one of my favorite verses. When I was young, I read this verse, 
And, and it just made sense to me, and I went, oh, I could be a part of that. I, I, I never liked religion. This is what it says in James 1.27. It says, religion, some translations say, the only religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. No other religion is acceptable to God. Shocking, isn't it? I say all the time, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's not supposed to be a religion. Religion has never saved anyone. Because when it really comes down to it, religion is all about how you look. It's all about appearances. It's about rituals and things that make you feel secure. I hate that word. Feel. The problem is that God doesn't even look at that stuff. And this is what I want you guys to understand. And Isabel, this is for graduates too. As you're getting out into the world, these are things to consider. God doesn't even look at that stuff. Um, if you'll remember when, when uh, Samuel is looking for the next king, and right before he, he gets to meet David, he gets to meet David's brothers. And David's brothers it seems like are kind of like specimen of men. Big, good-looking, strong guys, right? And so, so one of David's brother comes before Samuel, and, and Samuel's like, man, look at this guy. That's a king right there. And this is what it says. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him, not because of his appearance, or his height, keep in mind. Here's the most important words you're going to hear today. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man, there is so much we could get into in, in this little bit of Scripture, okay? You know, you've heard me say it all the time. I say this all the time, ever since I talked about meditating on God's Word. Meditate on this little bit of Scripture today. You know, uh, I've said some people read their Bible too much. If you're reading your Bible so much you don't have time to meditate on it, read your Bible less and meditate on what you read more. This is what I want you to meditate on today, this week, whatever. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. There's so much God will teach you from that. You could easily say, God doesn't look at the things that you look at. Or God doesn't look at the things that, that you look at that make you feel secure even sometimes. We're going to get to that. Some of those things on your list that are making you feel safe or making you feel secure, God doesn't even look at. Let that sink in. What does he look at? He looks deep inside where your thoughts take place, where your decision-making takes place, where your reasoning takes place. The place where your emotions are and your passions come from and your desires come from. It's where your allegiances lie. Where covenants are kept and broken. And I've seen God do miracles in those areas this week, man. You know why? That's what he really cares about. I think God cares about my eye. I don't think he cares nearly as much about my eye as he does about what's inside of me. The heart is very important to God. It's mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. A thousand times. My Bible had 1,300 pages. And 
the heart is mentioned a thousand times. God is really concerned about what's inside your heart. The scary thing is, and some of you guys have come to learn this, some of you even this week, the scary thing is that we can hide all kinds of stuff in there, at least for a while. And what makes it even scarier is that our heart even hides stuff about us from ourselves. You guys remember, I don't know, a year, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit longer ago, I did this um, sermon series. Tell me if you want me to do that again. I kind of, I kind of feel stirred to maybe do that again. It was a, a sermon series called "God Don't Like That." You guys remember that? And it was about lying, and it was about hands that. Um, uh, or minds that make evil schemes and 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 hate and things like that and and as we did that thing man god did god was doing stuff i remember people coming and saying man i i i am really thinking about what i say you know and and just this just comes to my mind as we were talking about uh, about this you know uh, there there's a verse in the bible I can't even tell you where it is i think it's in james but i might be wrong and it says that if you look at your brother and call him a fool, you're in bad shape. A fool. And we go, well, that's not even a mean word, really. God says it is. And so I remember during that series, people were going, man, God is speaking to me. I wonder, I wonder how many of us have, are still different from that. Maybe I have to do that, that series again because I know God was working through it. I understand why Jeremiah has such a strong opinion about the human heart. I remember the very first time I talked about the human heart to, to youth. I said, I want you to guess what I'm talking about. And I said, the Bible describes this thing as desperately wicked and the most deceitful of all things. And, and students were going, oh, it's the devil and it's, it's sin and it's lies. And I, and I said, no, it's the human heart. This is how the Bible describes the human heart. In Jeremiah 17, 9, this is the King James, King James Version says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The NIV Version says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. That doesn't sound good. Who can understand it? The New Living Translation says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? When we did that series, a lot of people started to realize that our hearts aren't quite as good as we thought they were. Even some people that really appeared to have it all together. I, I'm not going to make an example of this person, but there was this one person that I've always gone, man, this person is just so nice. And all, all this stuff, this, they came and said, man, I thought about this thing. And I know that there's something bad inside of me. I'm like, eh, it wasn't for you. It was probably for the person. That... But God does that, man. We all have room. We all have room. Makes this verse a lot more serious, doesn't it? People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the desperately wicked and deceitful heart. That's serious. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Who you are when you're on your best behavior on a Sunday morning is not who you are. Be careful not to fool yourself. Be careful not to let your heart fool you. God doesn't even look at that stuff. He doesn't even look at how you appear to people. Your heart is who you really are, and that's what God looks at. And I'm going to share with you this uh, short story where Jesus teaches this very lesson, okay? 
This is from Mark chapter 7. I think everything else on here is going to be from Mark chapter 7. And starting in verse 1, it says, One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. Probably for a good reason, I, I would imagine. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient tradition. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. They'd really get ridiculed today, wouldn't they? I'm just kidding. Jesus replied with an exclamation mark, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. I would hate for God to say that about me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own traditions. How many times have we seen this happen throughout the history of God's people and even the church? We ignore God's law and we substitute our own traditions that help us feel better about the way we live. You see this in in religion a lot. Where you have to say like say a, a certain prayer exactly right or you have to pray a certain time of day things like that and a huge problem with this i think it's a huge problem is that it gives people this false sense of security that that they that they do those things and so they're okay and has nothing to do with heart issues at all we not we might not be doing that stuff But sometimes, probably all of us, will pull out that kind of list of things that make us feel better about how we're living. I go to church on Sunday, I give, I serve in the nursery, which is impressive. You serve in the nursery. Babies stink, I know. And those are all great things that I think that you should be doing, but they, they make us look really good. Make us feel really good that we're doing something. But what does God really look at? This is something that we have to think about, guys. We all make this mistake sometimes. He goes deeper and he looks at why we do that. You see the difference? The Bible says that when we give, we're not to do it, out, do it reluctantly or out of compulsion, for God loves cheerful and joyful givers. You see where it becomes a heart thing. So this is where you ask yourself, why do I give? Because you have to? Because you don't want to see want somebody to see you not giving? That's not a good reason. Because it kind of makes you feel like you're paying your dues for other things that you're done or are doing in your life? Or is it because you know that God wants you to? And you want to be obedient to him. And you recognize that he's blessed you and you trust him to keep his promises. And you're happy to give back to him. This is where it becomes a heart thing. Here's a big one, guys. This is a big one. Now, now keep in mind, I think that you should come to church every Sunday that you can possibly come. If you're watching this at home, where's the camera? I think you should come back to church. I think you should come to church. I really do. But why do you come to church on Sunday? Why do you do it? 
Is it because you're anxious to be in the presence of God with other believers? You're anxious to worship Him corporately? Because you want to encourage other people within the body because that's the job that God said you have to do is encourage other believers or to be encouraged by other believers maybe? Is it because you're ready to give God praise and maybe receive something from Him or even if it's convicting in a way? Or is it because that's what you do on Sunday? Or maybe it's because, now let this, listen to these words and let this sink in. Because this could be a big problem. Maybe it's because it's the only thing that makes you feel secure in your relationship with Jesus. And maybe coming to church on Sunday is the only thing that makes you feel secure in your salvation. That's a bad place to be. I, I'm going to even be really blunt and say, if you come to church on Sunday because it's the only thing that makes you feel secure in your relationship with Jesus, you're not secure in your relationship with Jesus. It, it's really that simple. The wrong motives take even really good things and turn them into just tradition and religion. And God doesn't want to see that. He won't even look at it. But he looks deep inside where your motives can't be disguised. That means your heart can't trick God, even if it tricks you sometimes. This is what Jesus goes on to say. Then he said, listen to how he words this too. You skillfully, like, like you're good at it. He's saying, you're good at this, I get it. He said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own traditions. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. Eesh. Isabel, did you hear that? You're the only one, one. Oh, there's some other kids in here. You all listen up. But you say... It's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come here. All of you listen. Anytime Jesus says that, you pay really close attention to what he's going to say next because it has to be important. He says, all of you listen and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes out from your heart. Because he said, listen to this and try to understand it. These are more words to meditate on. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd. Do you love his message? Two sentences. And then he's like, that. He drops the mic. Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Don't you understand either, he asked? Can't you see that food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, there it is again, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. <laughs> by saying this, he declared, Every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Where does it come from? 
the heart. All these vile things come from within. They are what defiles you. And let it sink in. This is where God looks. Forget the traditions and worry about what's inside of you. You know, when we went over that thing for five weeks of things that God hates, all it all we were doing is revealing symptoms. People were going, yeah, I do that. Yeah, I do that sometimes. Never really thought of it this way, but, but I do that. Unfortunately, revealing symptoms doesn't fix the problem. Some of us are probably thinking of some things within us even now that we go, yeah, maybe it, it seems small right now. But if that's where God's looking, I don't want him to see it. You know, I, I think I used this example once when, when, I was, when I was talking about the heart another time. When it comes to your physical body, when you start noticing symptoms of a heart problem, what do you do? What do you do? Well, I like the way you said it, because if we're honest, a lot of us will ignore it and try to convince us ourselves that there's really not that big of a problem with our heart. How many of you have done that before? I remember Pastor Don Henderson. He said, yeah, I was having, I was having chest pains and stuff, and I thought, eh, I'm probably okay. I'm, I'm just being honest. That's probably what I would do, right? We're not always the smartest, are we? They say that the number one rule sur for surviving a heart attack is what? You, you, you're in the medical field. What is it? Yeah, don't ignore the symptoms, right? Do something about it. Men are really bad about it. Eh, it's probably nothing. <laughs> Larry has a heart attack almost every Sunday. It's funny. You say something, he's like, it's the big one, it's the big one. And I'm always like, is it really the big one or are you just joking me? <laughs> if you have symptoms of a heart problem, if you're thinking right now, right now, even if it's something stupid, like I just said, yeah, I call people a fool when they're, I'm driving, whatever. If you have symptoms of a heart problem, spiritually, you cannot ignore it. It will only get worse, I promise you. And don't convince yourself or let your heart convince you that it's something else. This is a bad habit of Christians. It's a bad habit. I was in a bad mood. So what? This person treated me bad, so I treated them bad back. So what? You made a decision. You did it. It's inside of you, or it wouldn't have happened. Right? And we, we, we're good at making excuses about little things. This is what Matthew 12, 33 through 35 says. We've got lots of stuff we can meditate on for weeks here. Listen to how serious this is put. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Make up your mind. This, this is serious, man. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, he says with an exclamation mark. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. I don't know any other way to say it. If there's evil things coming out of you, it's because there's evil inside of you. And it has to be addressed. And it has to be addressed right away. The symptoms that we are talking about are fruit of the tree that's growing inside your heart. That's how the Bible describes it. He says, make it a good one or make it a bad one. Because there's, there is no such thing as in between. 
The next rule for surviving a, a heart attack is go straight to the emergency room, right? Right, Chris? You should take an aspirin and get straight to the emergency room. Don't waste your time calling a friend and asking them what you think, what they think you should do. We, we get ourselves in all kinds of problems that way, don't we? Well, what do you think I should do in this situation? You, go to good people for good advice. Let me just say that. I mean, I, I've seen people going through stuff, really hard stuff, and going to the wrong people for advice and listening to what they have to say. That's bad. It's so bad. Don't waste your time calling friends to ask what they think you should do. They say, don't even try to call your doctor. Hey, I'm having chest, I'm having chest pain, and what do you think I should do? Don't even do that. Call 911 or get straight to the emergency room like, like Chris said. Why? Because a physician is your only hope. It's your only hope. And one of my favorite my, one of my favorite names that we call God, I don't even think this is in the Bible, but one of, the, one of the names we call him is the Great Physician. I love that name. I love it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys, if you, if you have, I'm telling me too, I guess. If you have symptoms of a heart problem, the Great Physician is your only hope. And there are people in here who over the last couple, two, three years, that I could point out and say, am I right? And they would tell you I am. Because I've seen God do things in them. After years of trying to fix it themselves and not having any luck. And then giving it to God and God goes, I can fix that. I can fix that. More stuff to meditate on here. <laughs> We're almost done. I didn't keep it short. I kept my part short. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. How many of you have the guts to say this to God? We have to. Search me, O God, and know my heart. I don't want God searching my heart most of the time. Search Larry's heart, right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. This is one of the most beautiful prayers you can possibly pray. See if there's anything wicked in me, God. And then lead me away from it. Lead me. And you know what I think God does every time? I can do that. I can fix that. I say all the time, it's almost the same thing. The, the prayer that God always answers is, show me what I need to change. We're just too scared to pray it. And this is what it's saying here. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me that I don't even see. Search my heart, God. And lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 51, 10 through 19 says, create in me a clean heart. This is what we really need. I mean, I've seen God, it seems like give people a, a new one. Like yours is really screwed up. Give you a new one. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I'm going to ask Paul to come on up. There is a lot to meditate on in those scriptures, man. A lot. And I, I know for sure that God is already speaking to people. He, he does it every Sunday, man. He does it every Sunday, and, and we just don't always let him finish the work, right? Sometimes he reveals those things inside of us, but then we don't let him lead us the right direction. And so that's what, uh, that's what I'm hoping is going to happen today. And Paul's going to play for just a second, and I, and I am going to be quiet for just a second. And I know it's getting kind of late, but if, if, if you do want to come up and spend some time at the altar and just pray and let God reveal 
things to you, if, if you're brave enough, I'm telling you, this is one of the most courageous things you can do, is ask God to search your heart and reveal anything that's wicked inside of you. It's scary. It's brave. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes if you want to come on up to the altar. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pray pretty quick here and you'll be dismissed and we'll have prayer partners come up, but I want to let people get to graduation if they need to, but I don't want to neglect this time. So if you feel like you need God to give you a checkup and search your heart, and if you're brave enough to do it, then I want to give you an opportunity. So I'm just going to be quiet. You can stay at your seat if you want, but I think God does powerful things at the altar as we step out in faith. I'm just going to give you an opportunity for the next couple of minutes. but I am going to ask her partners to come up and up over here out of the way and then just in there you can come right in the middle and if you have a prayer request prayer partners praying for nothing less than miracles keep it in mind we're praying for nothing less than miracles that's why these people are prayer partners because that's what they're going to pray for man so if you've got a prayer request, now's your chance to come up and get prayed for. I'm going to close, but it doesn't mean you need to leave. We're just going to allow people that do need to leave. But if you have a prayer request, don't leave without being prayed for. And don't be afraid to ask God for big stuff, man. Don't be afraid. Why don't we all stand together as we pray? Oh, God, we just thank you again for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and to worship you and to hear from you, Lord. And God, I believe that you're speaking to people today about these things that are still hidden inside of every one of us. And God, today I pray that you would examine our hearts and reveal to us any wicked ways that are still inside of us and that you would lead us in the right direction. God, today we pray for all the students that are graduating. God, that you would lead them and guide them and direct them and help them to understand that tomorrow's a new day and a new opportunity to make good decisions, Lord. That you would just guide them as they are the 
a future, Lord, that our future would be better because of students who are following your direction, Lord. And God, we pray that as we leave here today, hopefully some of us with new hearts and cleaner hearts, God, that we would be an example of what Jesus is like to people and that we'd be able to lead people to you because of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we love you guys. You're free to go. You don't have to go. We'd love it if you hung out for a while and chatted and got to know somebody. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.